Welcome in, everybody. I know some of you are probably in between sessions and, and joining us. Um, welcome to one of, I don't know, we got three more panels like this, I think, and another <laughs> premiere. Um, so we're, we're moving very close to the end, but we're not quite there yet. We have some great information for you from the ICA's new New Music uh, commu uh, Committee. And um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Daniel Dorf, Carrie Ravenstem, and John Russell. And they're going to be talking to you a little bit about the process of commissioning music and what the relationship between the composer and the performers is like and how you can get involved in something like that. So as always, type your questions in the chat. We'll try to address them at the end of the session, um, both here and on Zoom and on Facebook. So take it away, guys. Okay, well, um, I drew the short straw so I get to start. My name is Daniel Dorf, and just to put things in perspective, I started as a saxophone player, and by 11th grade, I was mostly doing composing and switched to clarinet because there wasn't a whole lot of, let's say, classical type of music. And at that point, I became a clarinetist and a bass clarinetist. But I've always been a composer and never a performance major, but keep on playing. I then got a day job after school doing proofreading for Theodore Presser Company, and then I became their editor. Actually, the first piece that came to me when I was the editor was timepieces that Musinski sent in his pencil manuscript, and I worked with him to get the publication ready. And then gradually I became the director of publications and vice president and so on. So I've been working for about 40 years with all different types of composers and performers to mediate their commissions and get things to go smoothly for them as well as with my own music. So with that in mind, I was eager to talk to performers about selecting the right composer in the right context for commissions. Very often you'll have somebody in mind from the start who you've wanted to have right for you. And when that happens, you have the advantages of knowing their music. You probably have the advantage of knowing whether or not they're reliable and going to be somebody good to work with, but although not always. The main thing I want to stress today is to know what your goal is with a commission, that it isn't always the same for every context. And a lot of organizations, maybe performers as well, sometimes commission the wrong composer for what they really wanted to accomplish. And it's fairly easy to avoid if you think about what is your real goal with a certain commission? So I thought I, I would go through some of the reasons why people do have commissions or do commission works. And the point that I wanna hammer home the most is every reason is good. However, um, however you think you want a piece to come out or the relationship with the composer is great, but just understand it yourself and have the understanding with a composer what you're looking for and pick the right person. So for instance, very often a commission comes because you want a special piece that you'll love to play and it doesn't already exist. And there's a composer perhaps who you know that you love everything that that person writes. Those usually go well. Sometimes you wanna have your name on the piece as the commissioner or the person it's dedicated to on a piece that will become standard rep and then your name will always be there. And when that happens, you want a piece that will have a chance of becoming standard rep. So you have that nice extra of being able to say, you know, that was written for me. Uh, very often a commission is for a special event or a special context or a special instrumentation. And when that's the case, you have to make sure the composer understands exactly what it is that you need or that you choose somebody who cares about what your needs are in that sense. Sometimes you want to commission a piece that is particularly difficult to showcase your abilities. For instance, if you're if you need a piece for a doctoral recital, I think it's wonderful recent years that many schools require a premiere on a doctoral recital. And when that happens, chances are you want something that will have some notable ways to impress the people who are giving you your degree. The exact opposite would be sometimes you want something that's particularly easy. For instance, if you have a chamber concert with one rehearsal or even less than, than a rehearsal, but you still want something new. 
or if you want to have a special experience, for instance, for your students. So again, as long as you know exactly what it is that you need and you make sure that you choose a composer who can do something like that, particularly if you want a student level work, a lot of composers aren't comfortable or even cognizant of what it means to write for somebody who's in their second year of playing and they've only learned flat keys so far, um, for example. A lot of people like to commission to hitch on to a famous composer for their name, their reputation, and their coattails. And by that association, you can get your name out there. And that's great. You know, some people maybe poo poo other performers who do that, but whatever your reason is, it's a good reason. If it's good for you, it's great for the composer, and it can be very symbiotic. And it's just always choose your composer wisely for what you want to accomplish. Somewhat related to that, a lot of composers are very good at self-promotion. The ones who can, or the ones who feel like that, can be really good for helping publicize your name and your performance, because they may have a CD deal, they may be very active on YouTube and other social media. If they're really a prominent name, they may help you get a performance at Clarinet Fest, because the program chairs like that composer. Similar to that, maybe you have a very generous grant from your school, and if that could give you a rare chance to commission somebody who normally you would assume to be out of your financial range. But related to that, always ask composers if you want them, even if you're afraid that they might be beyond your reach for finances or their timeline, because you never know. Sometimes some people are so humble or they're independently wealthy, they don't really care so much about the commission fee. They want their music out there, or maybe they want you to perform it. One thing that it's interesting, Vincent Persichetti told me that he never wrote a piece because of a commission, which I didn't believe at first. And what he said explaining that was, he wrote pieces on commission, but he never chose to write something because a commission was offered. He only wrote things that he wanted to write. And that's interesting because there have been times for me, for other composers, when we really wanted to write for a certain combination of instruments and somebody offered exactly that. That's a good time that maybe you can get a composer to write for a lower fee because they would have maybe done that anyway. I think one of the coolest things is Let's say you don't have much ability for, um, to come up with a good fee or any fee at all. It isn't always about dollars. There are a lot of ways that musicians, amateurs who have skills outside of music and a lot of musicians have peripheral skills can sort of barter or, or have some kind of symbiotic situation with a, particularly a lesser known or a younger composer who isn't getting commissions anyway or isn't getting fees anyway. It may be that if you promise them that you've got a CD on a known label and you're looking for pieces to put on it, that might motivate somebody to write a piece just to get on the CD or for them to bring to a tenure review that they have or any other kind of benefit. Like maybe you get on Clarinet Fest every time you apply and composers love to have their music performed at events like that. There are also a lot of skills. So many clarinet players are yoga teachers and or study yoga. It could be that a composer who lives near you could barter their way into your classes by lessons like that or clarinet lessons. I actually wrote a commission for a flute player who was an outstanding gardener. And I just bought a house that had a barren backyard and I wanted to live in sort of Giverny. So she took care of my garden I mean, or, you know, set it up, taught me how to take care of myself with the garden. I now know somebody who's done puppy breeding kind of deals for a commission fee. I mean, it's, you never know what you might want, you know, there's also engraving or audio editing. It isn't always about the money. Other reasons that come up a lot are because you want to support diversity. That has so many composers who you can choose from that all the other factors are still in play. It helps you filter down if that's what you want. Similar to that is maybe there's a composer who you know of who is struggling personally in their life. You want to give them some kind of shot in the arm. 
that can be a terrific thing to do. And it may be that there's a composer whose music you're not crazy about, but you really care about that person as a friend. Don't expect the best piece, but you might expect to have a really wonderful feeling that you've done that. All these situations are always in play in different ways. Similar, and I know people who have done this, maybe you need tenure. And one of the composers on the faculty where you teach is on the tenure committee. And it's a good way to stay on the good side of somebody if, and you know, nobody's the loser there. Some people say, oh, politics is usual, you know, but if you commission them to write a piece or say you'll put it on your CD, everybody benefits when, when that happens. And really the biggest conclusion I have is anything you want to do is fine, discuss it with the composer and this will come up. I'm going to pass it over to John now, unless Carrie, you have something on, on that topic. You'll hear similar things like this throughout this hour. Yeah, no, these were really great things. I really appreciated the fact that um, when we focus on commissioning, we are so concerned many times about having the financial means to support that. And especially in this day and age, there's so many more possibilities and opportunities for us to actually uh, make partnerships and, and relationships bloom without it being financially tied. Um, just having that conversation um, with composers and, and, and making agreements of not being a one and done in the composition really is a big thing today. Um, compositions and composers are looking for longevity, not just I'm going to do the world premiere and then it's going to sit on a bookcase for the rest of its time. So there are just so many different opportunities for us to be able to um, make that relationship happen. Um, and there are composers out there who are who are definitely willing um, to keep their options open just as we are. Um, so finding those people that we have relationships or would like to have relationships with, I think is is a really a positive way to address, you know, finding that great composer. So yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I th my plan now is to talk a little bit about um, sort of the commissioning process and especially um, just some tips for kind of do's and don'ts of the commissioning process. Um, I'm John Russell and I'm a, I'm a clarinetist and a bass clarinetist and also a composer. Um, so I've been on both sides of this. Um, I'm, I'm part of the bass clarinet duo Squonk and we've commissioned a lot of pieces for us. Then also as a composer, I've been commissioned a lot. So. Um, um, so, you know, because the composers and commissioners um, often have somewhat different concerns or priorities. And so I've been on both sides of that equation. So one thing, I mean, this is basically reinforcing some of the things that Daniel was saying. But um, to me, really, the most important thing about choosing a composer is that you generally like their music. Um, there's lots of other things to take into consideration, as Daniel was, was talking about. Um, but to me, that's really key, because if if they write you a piece and it's a drag to play. You don't like working on it. It's not good for you. It's not good for that composer. You're probably going to play it once and then never play it again. Whereas if you commission a composer you really like, they write you a great piece. You know, for example, my duo Squonk, there's some pieces we've played literally, probably literally over a hundred times because we like the composer and we really like the piece. So I think that's really important to not get caught up by prestige or things like that, um, at least not exclusively that. Um, and another thing I think that's really important to consider is, is to make sure that you as the performer really have the time and the resources to perform the commissioned work at a high level. Um, you know, because composers put a lot of work into this. So you really need to make sure that you are going to have the time, the mental space, the energy, you know, to really do to really do it justice and not kind of throw it together on one rehearsal at the last minute, which I think many composers have experienced that. And even if you're paid well, that can be very, very frustrating. And I really think you need to make sure you, know, you owe it to the composer to be able to do their piece justice. Um, fees are always tricky. I, I, it's, it's really interesting to hear some of these um, sort of creative alternatives to, to standard commissioning fee. Um, it's important to be aware that fees vary extremely widely from composer to composer. Um, you know, there's many composers who will happily write for free if they're starting out or if they're sort of think of themselves more as an amateur than as a professional um, or for various other reasons. You know, someone like John Adams probably have to pay them multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for a large piece. Um, and, you know, most composers are somewhere in between those extremes. Um, so just just a sort of a quick example, just from my own 
life, you know, this is, I'm the same composer in both these cases, but in 2019, there's one, I wrote a three minute quartet and I was paid almost twice as much for that piece as I was for a 47 minute orchestra piece. <laughs> so that just kind of shows the range is because that, that chamber piece, it was somebody I, I didn't know, it was a wealthy individual who asked me to write a piece for a private concert honoring a friend of theirs. It was a pretty strange ensemble, so it was not gonna be performed again. Um, I would have to sort of disrupt my whole schedule to write it. So I quoted them, you know, the you know, pretty high fee, thinking that if I didn't get it, that'd be fine. They said, yes, the orchestra piece. I desperately wanted to write this large piece for orchestra. This conductor who liked my music basically said, you know, you can write anything you want for us. I don't have very much money. Do you want to do it? So I said, yes. So anyway, it's just, just to illustrate kind of the range, even with the same composer, just different circumstances. Um, so in my experience, and actually I'd be curious, Carrie and Daniel, if, if you have a different experience with this, but in my experience, usually the composer um, first proposes the fee, um, unless there's like a specific grant funding it for a specific amount. Um, but at least in my experience, that's generally kind of the default is you ask the composer, you know, what would you, what would you like? But then it's always negotiable. So, and the important thing in, in fees is, is to be honest and direct. So, you know, if the composer proposes something that's twice as much as you can afford, just tell them that. Maybe they'll do it for half as much. Maybe um, maybe you can scale the scope of the piece back. Maybe it can be a five minute piece instead of a 10 minute piece. Or maybe they'll say, no, I can't do it for that little. And that's fine. You know, they have every right to do that. And um, you shouldn't really begrudge the composer for insisting on a certain fee. And if that's the case, um, you just need to find a different composer that you, that you can afford. Um, Another another important thing is I, I really recommend always having a contract um, with a composer, even if the okay. composer is a friend, um, maybe especially if the composer is a friend. Um, just having everything in writing really helps to deal with any misunderstandings that might arise, you know, make sure it's very clear what the deadline is, what the scope of the piece is, um, all that kind of stuff. Typically, even if there is a contract, you know, as long as there's good communication, um, you can you can negotiate that potentially. Um, but I think it's really important to have that in writing just to make sure that you don't have hard feelings down the road and that everything's very clearly spelled out. Um, and then just one more thing I want to add on the commissioning process. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, is that one option that I think is underutilized is, is having a composer arrange a pre-existing piece that they've already written for you. Um, which is something I've ended up doing quite a bit of. Um, the advantage of this is that you already know you like the piece, right? You know, commissioning a composer is always risky. Even if you like everything they've written, that piece they write for you might be a dud. And there's no way you, know, there's no way you can know that in advance. Um, it's likely to be cheaper because it's less work for the composer. Um, and also the composer has this opportunity for their, this piece they've written to potentially get a lot more performances if they know that you really like this piece and you're interested in having them arrange it for you. So, you know, some composers may not be open to this. And it, of course it depends on the piece a bit. Um, but I certainly had the experience recently where there was a group um, that was interested in commissioning me. They were just starting out. They didn't have very much money. We tried to get a couple grants and failed. Um, so then finally they suggested, well, what if you arrange a piece you've already written for us? So I sent them a bunch of possibilities to pick one they liked. Um, and I sort of reconceived it for them, which is actually a really interesting, enjoyable process for me. They paid me much less than they would have for a new piece and um, they performed it a bunch. And so that was definitely a win-win. And I think it's something people may not always kind of think of as, as a possibility that um, the composer might be able to take a piece that already exists and rework it for you. Um, so if, if unless either of you have anything to add to those, I think Daniel's gonna talk about contracts and kind of what what those should entail. Sure, I just had a few things to add to that, John. Um, by the way, um, my name is Carrie Ravenstem. I'm actually a clarinetist. Um, I'm the co-founder of Atonal Ensemble. It's a contemporary chamber group uh, based in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I, uh, about two and a half years ago, I commissioned five new works for Louisville from Louisville composers um, for an upcoming CD that I'm working on. And I have the distinct privilege of actually being married to a composer. <laughs> so I get to see both sides of this coin um, on a regular basis, um, being the performer, um, you know, regularly, but also being able to see um, what the composition uh, life is like in my own home. So it's 
been it's been an adventure. Um, as far as um, working with the commissioning, other things to consider is um, if the costs that you're going to be incurring include your copyist, um, or is the copyist cost going to be separate? Is that going to be handled by the composer, or are they going to be hiring that out? So you need to make sure that that's also considered in your pricing. Also, time frame and payment schedules. Um, are they looking for payment completely upfront? Um, or is it going to be in installments? And what kind of time frame? And as John was saying, we want to make sure that you have that in writing. If you are banking on performing this as a world premiere and you're marketing this as a world premiere in 18 months, is the composer going to be done in 18 months? And if not, what kind of liability is there going to be based on that, you know, financially for you as well as a composer? So these are things that we need to um, be careful of in, you know, the contracting process. Um, also too, uh, some composers want you to have the world premiere done within uh, X amount of time once the, the work is finished. Um, I know, and composers spend so much time writing specifically um, a piece of music and changing the schedule around to be able to incorporate that. Say no to collaborations and other commissions while they're working on your piece. If they write to a piece and then you decide not to play it for six or eight years, that may not be what they were looking for in the first place as far as the partnership goes. So having that and being mindful of that, that this is a partnership, it's a relationship, is really positive for us, you know, for growth in the future and then potentially having another uh, collaboration later on in the future with that same composer. So things to consider, you know, when doing the contractual work. It's really fascinating to transition over to what I prepared to talk about with what should go into a contract after hearing what John and Carrie say, because we've, we're addressing some of the same things with some slightly different angles, but the same concerns. And for those of you who are listening, it's a really great opportunity to hear all these different points of view that enhance each other without contradicting. So the, the first thing I wanted to stress is also, as John said, always have a written agreement. The agreement and contract, they mean the same thing. Agreement is a gentler word, so usually people <laughs> prefer that. But as long as it's signed by both parties, it means something you know that you can count on. And if it's not signed by both parties, it really is nothing that you can hold each other to other than in good faith, which usually is there but not always, um, it's essential that you discuss anything that you care about. And that includes what happens after the premiere, as well as the piece itself and everything leading up to it. And don't take anything for granted, especially with your friends, like John said, innocent misunderstandings happen all the time. And often it's because it seems so obvious to the composer what of course, is the only way that certain things happen. And it seems so obvious to the performer and commissioner that it's obvious the way things happen in some regards. But they weren't making the same assumptions, and then there was a misunderstanding. Um, it's not saying I don't trust you to insist on getting something in writing. It's actually saying I respect our friendship so much that I want us to make sure that we don't accidentally get into a conflict later. And for that matter, way later, it could be that the estate of one of you has a problem. You know, I, working in publishing, I've seen that happen. Um, and one one party might need a contract to show to a record label or a publisher later on about what rights were done, and then it's all there in writing. So my take on the fee and payment schedule is almost identical word for word with what Carrie said. Usually composers, want to get a partial fee up front and that's a commitment that says that you really mean it it's like earnest money because most composers are juggling or most composers of a certain established level are juggling deadlines and juggling requests and some might come in with a short deadline and then they have to know what to how to prioritize what they're working on with commissions that are likely that don't pan out that can be confusing, but once there's that money down there, people and I've never seen anyone back out once they started the payments and then pay the rest on the balance. 
some people, and this is both the commissioner and the composer, like to split it over calendar years for tax benefit or you know, to keep their taxes smooth. Usually it doesn't matter unless you're talking about a large fee for the, the tax. But one my my ritornello for this part of the, the day is as long as you both agree to it and it's in writing, it's fine. You know, there's no rules about what you have to do, but agree on it. So um, related to that, what if you are going to be um, paying an international composer? Or if you're in a different country, I, I say that like everything exists here. Um, currency has changed. So not only does the value of a dollar change within our country, but the exchange rates change. And different ways of paying people foreign, some have service charges and some don't. So think that through if it applies. One thing that's important and misunderstanding, misunderstandings happen is the duration of the piece. I feel you should always have the minimum duration in a contract because what if you're assuming, of course, it will be seven to 10 minutes or if it's Sonata, of course, it will be 10 to 20. If it doesn't say anything in the contract and the composer gives you a three minute piece, you can't really tangibly say, where's the rest of it? If you say the that you want a, a piece between seven and 10 minutes, it's usually not a problem if it goes long. I would say always have a minimum time, have a maximum if you care. A maximum actually kicks in if, for instance, you're writing something for a particular concert where it can't go long. I wrote a piano concerto that was 10 minutes too long for a concert that was going to be in Carnegie Hall, not realizing what was the problem. In Carnegie Hall, they said, yeah, we'll be glad to play your piece. You have to pay the stand chance about $60,000, but you know we can manage that. So that got premiered somewhere else. <laughs> But, and I was never warned not to do that. Otherwise, you know, I, I would have known. Um, smaller cases like that do happen a lot. I think the Janacek Sinfonietta was originally a fanfare and he went from five minutes to like 45. <laughs> I don't know that anybody minded the world's a better place for it. Um, talk about instrumentation. Uh, it, in some cases, it may be very simple if you're writing a sonata for clarinet and piano. Most people don't care if it's B flat or A, other than student pieces. But what about doublings? And if you are writing for bass clarinet, is it okay to go down to C? And the same kind of question goes for a chamber piece or a larger ensemble piece. What are all the other instruments? What are the doubles that would be okay for the other instruments? What if it's a flute and clarinet duet? Can you write for bass flute or contra bass flute? For some people that's okay and for some people it isn't. So get these things out of the way in, in writing. And one of the reasons why I stress in writing is that a lot of times you can have conversations where somebody says, yeah, that should probably be okay. Well, what if the composer hears that should probably be okay? The performer didn't mean it as a commitment. The performer was thinking out loud in good faith. And then later there's something that can't really be done. So that's why the document is important. And that also includes details like maybe you have an artistic thing, like it has to be multi-movement or it has to be one movement or a suite where individual movements can be played separately for school concerts or you want a sonata because you're doing a big recital and you have to have a sonata on it. So it has to be a piece that could be called that. A lot of commissions have extra musical references like the town that it's gonna be played in or the inspiration of a famous person or historical event. Not always, but if it means something to you and if that's what you've been talking about, it should be in writing if you want it to be important. I don't usually see anything mentioned about extended techniques in contracts, but if you particularly want a piece that will deal with various extended techniques, or if you're concerned that you might get stuck having to play something that you don't like or know how to play, it's easy enough to agree in writing in advance uh, that you will or will not have that. The delivery date 
and what Carrie brought this up, and it can happen in a lot of different situations. Most of my personal experience with commissions is that there's a premiere date or at least a premiere season that's being planned in advance. And the composer is given a delivery deadline. And usually there will be an exclusive period to give the premiere. Let's say it's a year after or half a year after whenever, whatever, whatever is agreed again in writing, that works great if the composer delivers the piece on time. If the composer doesn't deliver the piece on time, which happens pretty frequently by a small amount, you know, maybe it's a few weeks late and there was a six month buffer, that's usually not a big deal. But sometimes it could be like, okay, well, clarinet fest is in three weeks and I still don't have the piece. Any performers, most performers are gonna say, we've got to delay it. So what happens, what, you know, some composers are fine with grace periods like that. Some performers are fine with grace periods like that. Anything that you agree to decide in advance because um, unforeseen things will happen. And that also leads to force majeure, which is a term that many people never even heard until there was coronavirus or act of God, I think used to be used for if there's a tornado and it tears the roof off of the concert hall, or if the performer has a broken arm and just really can't do it, it isn't like they're deferring a performance because they're not ready yet. These things need to be in a contract, like what happens if, and you decide between each other what happens if. There's another kind of timeline for exclusivity that is very sensitive and it's very important, which is what happens after the premiere. Some performers and organizations want to have an entire season of exclusivity or some period of time after the actual premiere does take place. Many composers don't want to do that but they're willing to accept what they consider a reasonable amount of buffer time. Uh, I, I tell people, if you want the, if you want to be able to have an extended exclusive period, I'd like a larger fee than we were originally going to be talking about because that will impede my ability to promote the work. And conversely, if it's okay for me to circulate the work once the premiere has taken place, I'm going to be more generous with accept or more flexible with accepting what might be a lower fee because I'm so relieved that I can get the, the music out there right away. I think that other composers may have that same flexibility, but it's always something to be aware of. In, in some cases, performers may not really have any plans for a subsequent performance. Sometimes if there's a tour, performer might really have a good reason to, to want to black out the piece if they're going to be doing some high profile things. And when that's the case, the, compute, the composer may be delighted because if you're going to go play something at a big convention and in some other venues, you'll have a happy composer. I think that performers and other commissioners should always put in the contract require that the commission information will always be on the sheet music, whether it's self-published or published publicly. I don't know that there's any reason why a composer might not want to do that, but they might forget or they might not even think about it. But you've put up a lot of your commitment and helped give birth to the piece, so it should be there. You and uh, assuming that what John said about reworking old pieces is really interesting and a great idea when that's what you want or when that is a solution, but you don't want that to happen when you don't ask for it. And so I've seen some agreements, which I think it's a great idea. It says, require that you get a new piece and not an adaptation of an old one. And there are a number of composers who take every commission that's offered to them and don't have time to write as many and recycle works for other instruments. In some cases, the performers are delighted to get anything from that composer because it will have their name on from that composer. Yeah, I've also seen this go into high, prof high profile litigation in, in the newspapers that this orchestra piece is actually the same thing as a sonata that was written 20 years ago 
and the composer got a tremendous amount of money for not writing a new piece. So as long as you discuss it, as long as it's up front, that can be okay. It's also important to discuss the audio and video documentation of the premiere or performances from the premiere season. Every composer really needs to get a recording with at least limited rights to share the recording among performers who might want to do it or for them to learn from listening to it. And reciprocally, every performer should be able to walk away with a, a recording of their performance that they're allowed to at least share in a limited kind of way. These days, things have evolved these days, meaning the last 20 years. Um, putting it, something on your website or on YouTube or other free types of social media, it's rather standard, but I feel the composer and the performer both need to agree with that because maybe somebody's not happy with how the premiere came out and the composer might misrepresent how good the performer is, the performer might misrepresent the tempo that the composer wants. So that should be restricted or you can sign in advance or say, you know, no extra fees, but we both have refusal. Again, whatever you both agree to do that in advance, not after the performance. You could say we'll decide after the performance, but don't start discussing it. I had a, a mentor in publishing who used to say you can't unscramble scrambled eggs. And that's true with a lot of types of agreements. You can't get permission after you've done something or, or you can't really deal with it well trying to do that. And I only mentioned at this point things like YouTube, commercial use of recordings. I think maybe it's more obvious. You can't do that without everybody agreeing to, to that. But YouTube has really, YouTube and, and other other outlets have really changed the entire recording world because a standard part of almost every commission agreement I've ever seen has to do with if the performer can have first choice at recording rights for a commercial recording. And I've seen fights happen because of this, because let's say somebody has the first rights to a CD, but somebody else can still put out a YouTube and have 100,000 views, which the CD is never going to get heard that many times. So that's almost become moot, just something to stay aware of. It's, it's a problem with, with all media these days. So that's the end of the, the points I wanted to write down, except for one thing that should always be at the end of any contract of any kind, not just music. There's a, a clause like this agreement is the complete agreement between parties. Any further alterations must be added as a rise as a writer signed between both parties. And that is because a lot of times you can do a great job of getting this contract with everything in it. And then later on, let's say the performer says, well, I know that we agreed to a year exclusive, but I know you have this great opportunity, so it's okay. And then that wasn't in writing. Someone else performs it at a big convention and the performer said, oh, I, you know, we started to talk about it, but we never really decided. Get it in writing. It can, it can save friendships or vice versa. And yeah, John, go ahead. Cause I I'll have a quick question about that. This. If, yeah. if there's like an email exchange about this in writing, does that, could that count? Do you really yeah. Yeah. You know, the, about 20 years ago, the government changed the law about emails being binding. I didn't quite understand that because you don't have to be really an expert at technology to fake an email or, you know, to be able to produce something that looks like an email that wasn't written. I mean, you can do that with signatures too, but in our world, there's no money at stake. Like it's, it isn't worth cheating. You know, it's a funny thing to say because we're all important, but it's not like in pop music, but I, I, if it's an email, you know, you can still say, Hey, look, we decided on January 12th that it was going to be okay. If a different person plays it at clarinet fest, no, you know, that's hard to deny. So unless Carrie is something back to John for collaborating. Um, just one small thing, uh, as a performer, um, 
do not be afraid to reach out to your composer while they're in the process and ask if you can hear or see what is being written. Um, from my personal experience of commissioning, um, sometimes we're listening to things that composers have written in the past and we love the language and we're like, yes, this is what we want. But if the composer knows you and knows what you can do and your ensemble or whomever you're having them write for, sometimes you get a language that you've not heard before because they are writing specifically for you. And this can be an amazing thing. And sometimes it can be a very challenging thing because it's not what you expected. So, you know, keeping that communication open and not just saying, okay, here, here's the check, here's the contract, and I'm going to walk away and let me know when you're done. Keeping that door open and, 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 and saying, hey, I'd, I'd love to hear, or, or, you know, can we listen to some things, or do you want me to try some things out during that process of, you know, of the actual um, composition time, I, if you talk about that ahead of time, I think that will allow for there not to be any unnecessary surprises that could actually, you know, create some kind of tension between you and your composer. Um, most times it works out for the best, but it's always going to be those one or two times and it doesn't that is going to leave a sour taste in your mouth. So again, just keeping those relationships positive, keep that communication open and say, hey, it would be great if, you know, we could have a, a check in and really, you know, to be able to listen and see how things are going and, and making sure that what you're looking for and what you agreed upon in the beginning is actually coming to fruition in the work. I don't think that's anything wrong with that. Yeah, I want to, I was about to say something and I see that Diane Barger has asked a very relevant question to it about feedback, either during the process or after. It's critical, you know, composers who aren't clarinetists, especially may want to hear sketches played back for them or ask how does this sound. I'm writing a piece for unaccompanied bongos right now, and I'm trying to get the the commissioner to play sketches so I know more of what I'm doing, because it, it's tricky. But especially after, um, yeah. and I'm wondering, because I just wrote Diana a piece and sent it to her a few months ago. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens if I say, yeah, if I'm, if I'm going to get a lot of feedback, but that would be great. Um, and Jeremy Wolitz has asked about going the other way around with composers seeking a performer? Absolutely. Um, but generally, since the performer is paying the composer, I would love to go around to various performers and say, hey, could you commission me? But I don't like asking for money in that way. But I might say, hey, I'd love to write a piece for you if the context ever works out. Yes. That, so, and that is, that's exciting for us as well, too. There, there is nothing just more humbling and just just makes us um, as as clarinetists go. Gosh, uh, you you're enjoying me as a performer. Absolutely, let's let's talk about this. I mean, that's just that's a wonderful way to keep. Again, it it has to be two way through this whole process. There, yeah, there's one think, thing that. Oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. I was just gonna say I do think if if you're the composer approaching the performer, um, yeah, I do, I do think it is a little bit awkward to then say like, and my commission fee is you know five thousand dollars or something. Like the presumption is. You know, I'm just thinking if, if a composer I'd never heard of approached me and said, hey, I want to write you a piece and this is how much I charge, I'd probably be like, what? Who are you? You know, but, it, but if it's <laughs> yeah. just like, hey, I really, I, I like your playing, I have this piece, or I'd like to write a piece, you know, and, may, you know, maybe we could come to some kind of agreement about a, a fee as well. Mm -hmm. But I think, you you know, you sort of, you have to sort of be, be aware that you're in sort of a weak negotiating position from a price point if you were the one approaching. Mm -hmm. So, John, we might as well stop talking let you do your last part yeah <laughs> well I, I, I just wanted to respond this actually ties into it a bit um into mm -hmm. some, diane's question as well i do think that there's kind of um composers can be a bit variable in terms of how much they want to um sort of have it be a collaborative process versus the composer just kind of goes into their cave and comes out in six months with a masterpiece um and i think in my experience that's typically more composer led like if the composer often has sketches and like, I'd really like feedback on this. Can you try, you know, these five different ways of playing this passage? I think use performer should definitely be responsive to that. I think it's really great when the composer does that. I think if the composer doesn't naturally want to do that, it's, it can be a little bit tricky to try to kind of force that to happen. 
And I think, I, I mean, I may be disagreeing slightly with, with Carrie on this and that I think there's a danger of, of the commissioner of it's in the commission sort of micromanaging the process a little bit. And so, oh, so sure. I, think, sure. I think ultimately, you know, you need to choose a composer who the, the, there's, the, you know, the very kind of trusting sort of leap of faith to commission a composer mm -hmm. and sort of the default agreement to me is that, you know, you set the time, the length and the instrumentation, and then the composer kind of has free reign to do whatever they want. And if, if, if you want more specific, like a certain style or a certain difficulty level, then you kind of need to specify that in advance. Yeah, um, it, it can depend. It's tricky, though. Yeah, I've also had the experience where you like think the composer does this kind of thing. And actually, I've also been that composer where it's like, you know, <laughs> in an aesthetic direction. And I'm suddenly really excited about, you know, minimal drones instead of like fun, groovy music. And the commissioner's like, yeah, you know, what is this? And it, it, so it's a tricky <laughs> thing. But ultimately, it's, it's kind of a leap of faith. And I'm not sure there's that much you can do if the composer sort of chooses a different aesthetic direction, unless you. Well, the yeah. Music. If somebody said to me, Thanks for the piece that you wrote for me, but I don't like it, or I don't like the whole, you know, the concept of the piece or whatever. It's sort of too bad. But if somebody says to me, and this happens a lot, um, this you know, slurring three octaves back and forth quickly, it's awkward. Can I tongue it? That kind of stuff. Or I need a breath. Where should I breathe in mm -hmm. here? To me, that doesn't even count as collect. I mean, that's of course you would right. do that. And I think I think some composers beautiful. can be touchy about that, but I don't think they should be. Like I think you, as the clarinetist, especially if the Performer. composer is not a clarinetist, mm -hmm. like you know so much more about the clarinet than the composer does. And you know there might there might be a run they wrote where like if you left out a note or added a note, suddenly it becomes easy instead of almost impossible. And I think even that kind of thing, mm -hmm. even changing notes, you should be able to try to approach the composer about that, or say you know something would sound much better an octave lower. Um, yeah. It's a it's an organic opportunity here. He, that's the the glory about working with a living composer. Yeah, is that we can communicate what's going well, what's not, and if this isn't going well, what what are you wanting it to be, and how can we achieve that as the performer? Which is that's just an amazing part of this process. Yeah. Yeah, I think the key thing to remember in all of this is that you, the commissioner and the composer both have the same goal, which is to create a high quality piece of music that can be performed well, right? And I feel like it's very easy for either side to sort of get stuck in your own perspective or your own ego a little bit and to really, you know, always trying to be kind of like stepping into the other side's shoes a little bit and be like, okay. Yeah, and that's why you choose your composer wisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's really easy to find a lot of their music these days. Whoever yeah. it is, yeah, um, yeah. You know, just sorry. One other thing on the collaborative process I was going to mention was that I I think it's good to, as the commissioner to be proactive about letting composers know about about your playing preferences or like you know the extended techniques that you are or aren't comfortable with. I do think composers like I always try to ask about that as a composer. You know, be like, what extended techniques can you do? Can you circular breathe? Are you comfortable improvising? Have you played any genres outside of classical music? I always kind of ask those questions, but if composers don't, I think it's really smart for the commissioner to proactively offer that information to the composer. Should we take questions if there's any yeah. more? Any other questions? So someone asked uh, about think, copyright yeah. and concerns. Yeah, the, the copyright, and this should also be in the contract. I'm glad, Ian, I'm glad that you asked that. The copyright in in what it is always goes to the composer unless you're okay. stipulating that it was a work for hire. For instance, if you are doing a film and you hire somebody to do a score for it, if it's a recital kind of piece, it stays with the composer, but that should be in writing. Yeah. Royalty concerns um it depends what you're asking the performer wouldn't get royalties on it but the performer shouldn't have to pay the composer performance royalties they've already taken mm -hmm. care of that and yeah. if it's an orchestra commission that can be more complicated than if it's a recital piece Ian, i don't know if that answered your question but i hope it was helpful. Yeah, but yeah typically if you're commissioning like let's say a clarinet and piano piece you know that composer will be registered with ascap or bmi and so they'll, have, they'll already have a way of collecting their performance royalties. Their royalties. Mm -hmm. And you paid them already. Right. You paid them the fee. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, I have a question. What do you do when you commission a work and you don't take the correct steps, as you've all discussed about communicating, and then you end up with a piece at the end that is less than satisfactory to what you had hoped, um, and the composer is very insistent that you premiere the work, even though you don't feel that it's quality enough to do that? It's a very d difficult discussion, I know, um, but I'm sure I'm not the only person that has this question. Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, I, I do feel like you basically have an obligation to premiere it, but not necessarily mm -hmm. ever play it again after that. I mean, unless mm -hmm. those are really like fail to meet, you know, it's like half a length it's supposed to be, or you specifically told them don't do these things and they did them, but. Well, so yeah. I, I learned the clause to add to commission agreements when I did a piece with Barbara Haney because her brother's a lawyer and read our commission agreement. <laughs> and this is um, Flowers of St. Francis that was done in Assisi. And her brother said, you should add something that says, if performer fails to um, give their premiere within X amount of time, which could be refuses to, or you know doesn't like the piece, the commission fee and the commission wording both remain intact, but the um, the premiere will expire, but the money doesn't go back and the commission notice still has to stay there, which I think that's a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fair on both sides. So Barb, if you're listening, thank your brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's about all the time we have, unfortunately. I know that many other people probably have questions that will come to them. So you can um, reach out to members of the new music committee um, with any questions you have, and you can certainly join um, our upcoming meeting, as I mentioned in the last panel. So you can find information about that on our website um, under the committees tab. And I encourage you all to attend that meeting on February 14th. Um, we have a lot of really great ideas and things that are working, um, that the new, new music committee is working on. And we really appreciate all of their hard work here. Um, we have another panel starting in just a few minutes um, about um, repertoire, contemporary repertoire from New Zealand. So I hope you all will join us. And thank you to Daniel and Carrie and John for um, all of this great information. Um, and we will see you all in just a few more minutes. Bye. And thank you, Jessica and Jenny and ICA for giving us this opportunity. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.